You're listening to the Unwritable Rant Podcast with your host and bourbon soak storyteller, Juliet Miranda. Hey there, y'all. It's Juliet Miranda, and this is episode 142 of the Unwritable Rant Podcast. I have two bourbon soak stories for y'all today about summer school retribution and pyrotechnic snoozing. But for there to be bourbon soak stories, we got to have some bourbon. So I'm pouring myself a glass of barrel bourbon batch 15. Cheers, y'all. Barrel is what is known as an NDP, a non-distilling producer. So that essentially means they select their bourbon from different distilleries and rickhouses, blend them, and then release them under their own brand. It's a little bit of mad scientist work in a way. And I know not everyone is a fan of this kind of production, but I gotta say, Barrel is genius. I've had seven of their releases, and they have all been excellent, and they're all different in their own way. Batch number 15 is outstanding. Whew, I love this stuff. It's made from a blend of 9, 10, and 11-year-old bourbons. And since it's a blend, we don't have a very specific mash bill, but we know generally it's corn, rye, and malted barley. And it is bottled at cask strength, 107 proof. But even with that potency, this is a really, really well-balanced bourbon. It is full of cinnamon and ginger. I'll tell you, the ginger will hit you in this. And then it's got this remarkable sweetness to it. A lot like, kind of like a a green apple a little bit. It's a little tart. It's really sweet. And then it rounds out and you get this wonderful toasty corn sort of flavor. It is a lovely summer sipping bourbon. And if you want to know more about it, I'm going to be posting a tasting video on my YouTube channel in the next couple of days. So driving through town the other day, I saw a couple of kids standing on a bus stop in the morning, and I couldn't help but feel a little bit sorry for them, because most likely they were headed for summer school. And I know, few things suck more than summer school, because I had to go. This was back in junior high, which was not a good time for me. Socially, scholastically, and even physically. Around the third and going into the fourth quarter of my seventh grade year, I got seriously ill. I mean, this was the kind of illness that had me in the hospital and out of school for weeks. Everyone's big concern was making sure that I didn't get held back. And that would have been a distinct possibility, but my parents hired a private tutor to make sure that I got through all of the required segments for graduation. And really, my instructors were tremendously helpful and accommodating towards my tutor. All except for one guy, my algebra teacher. He was as much of an old maid as any 30-something guy can be. He was scrawny and short, and he had this bushy red mustache and perfectly circular bald patch on the top of his head. And sweat just perpetually stained the pits of his shirts. And when he spoke, this thin trail of pure white spit would just linger between his lips and kind of vibrate like a piano wire. Oh, so gross. He was in every way just a self-righteous, unpleasant man who took fiendish delight in writing these complex equations on the board, and then he would humiliate kids to tears for not being able to solve them. This is the kind of guy we're dealing with here. As for me, while I've made no secret about the fact that I have never excelled at math, and quite honestly, I am so horrible at it, my parents didn't know if they should keep tutoring me or just buy me an ice cream cone and cut their losses. And this exponential jack wagon of a teacher, well, he certainly didn't help anything. He would give my tutor these cryptic notes about assignments, and then when I was finally well enough to return to school, He spent the last few weeks of the semester just mercilessly badgering and berating me for being behind. Although I do have a confession to make here. For as much as this guy was a genuinely shitty teacher, I can't claim to be entirely innocent here. Because once I understood that this guy had just written me off, I fought back in the only way a 13-year-old knows how. By being a complete asshole. 
Sample size deodorant sticks would just magically appear on his desk every so often. Chalk would vanish from the room, and one time, his desk was coated from top to bottom in petroleum jelly. None of these cute little pranks could ever be traced back to me, but it was assumed by pretty much everyone, including the algebra tyrant, that I was the one to blame. Then, of course, the guy got the last laugh when I opened my report card that June and saw the giant red letter I in the middle of all of my A's and B's. The guy hadn't even graded me. He'd just given me an incomplete. And that was an automatic ticket to summer school. My parents and I tried to fight it, because technically speaking, I had completed all of the required assignments to earn a passing grade. And oh, God, I can just, I remember that horrible meeting in the principal's office. Being there after school had cleared out just felt wrong. And I resented it. How my parents resented being there. Because my illness had been really hard on all of us. And I kind of think they dreaded carting me to and from summer school just as much as I dreaded going. I mean, we all really needed that summer for a break. So they did their best to argue on my behalf. And they even suggested bringing in another private tutor for me. But the algebra tyrant held his ground and insisted I retake the entire math year. And then, this is unbelievable, the guy looks at my dad dead in the eye and he goes, your daughter is not smart. Woo, them's fighting words. (laughs) Now look, my dad knew full well how badly I sucked at math, but he wasn't about to let that creep call his firstborn a moron. He leaps up and he jabs his finger into that guy's chest and he says, Your class is the only one in her curriculum giving her any problems. So perhaps we should be questioning your intelligence, you ill-begotten mole rat. A tyrant clearly wanted to punch my dad and was pretty close to it, but the principal intervened. He had a compromise. His suggestion was that I retake just the second semester rather than the entire year. And even I had to admit that that was a reasonable idea because I had already legitimately passed the first semester, and I didn't want to do it over. And God knows I didn't want to sacrifice my entire summer to algebra. The tyrant does not like this idea one bit, but he realizes he can't argue it. So instead, he just hurls a threat my way and says, Don't even think about getting sick this summer, kid, or you will be repeating all of seventh grade math next year. He stomps out of the room then, and I'll tell you, if he had a cape, he would have twirled it around himself like some sort of old-timey villain. The dick. My summer school sentence was set to begin in July then, which gave me just one month off. One sorry month of vacation. That I fully intended to use to plan how I was going to get revenge. Seriously, I hadn't done anything to this guy. I mean... Till he provoked me. <laughs> but even then, I would never punish a kid for missing class due to illness. And sure, you know, the argument could be made that I'd maybe learn something by retaking the semester. And that would be true if the teacher was at all interested in being one. Because this guy, he didn't want to teach. He wanted to dictate. Of course, like all 13-year-olds, I pretty much had the intention span of a goldfish. So I eventually forgot my plans to stick it to the algebra tyrant, and I did my best to enjoy what little summer I did have. In fact, I put the guy out of my mind completely. Until my town's 4th of July parade. It was easily the biggest event of the year in my town. They held it the weekend before the holiday. And then it was followed with a big parking lot carnival and craft fair. I mean, every local business and community organization participated. I mean, people planned the entire year for this thing. And it was something of a rite of passage to be in the parade. I was in first grade when my brownie troop marched in it. And that year, my sister was making her first appearance with my mother's garden club. So to make sure we caught all of the action, my dad and I camped out hours early on Main Street. And I remember the parade that year as being especially ornate. 
And looking back now, I can say that that was probably due to the 80s economic boom. But at the time, I just saw a town that was excited to celebrate. Now, we weren't really a small town by any means, but we were all familiar with each other. And everybody was there at the parade. You know, I said hello to the guy who sold my dad his car. I waved to my favorite librarian. And then there in the middle of the parade was my fucking algebra teacher. He was marching with six other guys who were all dressed as the founding fathers. And despite the knickers and the tights and the ruffled shirt, my algebra teacher carried himself less like Alexander Hamilton and more like Stalin. He wasn't waving, and hell, he wasn't even smiling. Frankly, he looked annoyed to be there. So I nudge my dad, and I'm like, hey, that's my algebra teacher. I point him out, and then when my teacher sees me, I wave at him. I mean, it was a parade, right? I might as well be nice. But that militant dickhead just ignored me completely. I mean, he went out of his way to look the other direction. Which my dad sees, and bless his heart, he yells out, Hey, Hamilton! And then he gives the guy the finger. (laughs) You have to understand, my dad was a big fan of giving the finger. I mean, some guy would cut him off in traffic, and he'd get the finger. Another guy might take the last six-pack of St. Pauli girl beer. He'd get the finger. My dad wasn't a yeller, and he wasn't really a fan of profanity, so extending that middle finger always got his point across. And every time he did it, he would look over at me and he would explain. Sometimes, words are just wasted on people. And I'll tell you, that finger certainly wasn't missed by my algebra teacher who immediately leaves his founding father procession to cross the street and confront my dad. Who, by the way, now has already moved on. And he's excited to see that the Shriners are approaching in their funny hats and tiny cars. And my algebra teacher's yelling. He's saying, I saw what you did, I saw that. But his yells are beginning to be drowned out by the motors on the Shriner cars, which everyone but him seems to be aware of. The Shriners are an extension of the Freemasons. They're a good-hearted bunch of guys. And they seem to be in every parade everywhere. But in case you haven't seen them, let me explain. They drive what are essentially mini go-karts. And they're decked out to look like real cars. You know, or something whimsical like flying carpets or whatever. Now, sometimes if the parade slows down or stops... They drive their little cars in formations, you know, like figure eights or loops, until the parade picks up and they can move forward. So that's what's happening right now. They're circling the street as the parade pauses. They're waving at the crowd who's cheering and waving back. While Hamilton, my algebra teacher, is shaking his fist at my dad. He stopped a few feet in front of us. I can't hear him exactly, but I can tell that he's yelling thanks to that disgusting elastic spit trembling on his lips. And I try to shrink down next to my dad because I am confident that a new revolutionary war is about to occur right there on Main Street. Hamilton totally looks ready for battle. But my dad, he's playing it cool. He ignores Hamilton, which just seems to annoy him more. So he steps forward again, just as the Shriners are going into another turn. And as this serpentine procession curves around to the left, One guy in this cute little red car clips Hamilton and sends him stumbling into the path of another red car. And this one hits him head on, knocking Hamilton right out of his buckle shoes and onto the ground. (laughs) And here is what a different time the 80s were. No one stops the parade. No one gets out of their little red cars. No one films the incident. Instead, the crowd starts yelling at Hamilton. Get out of the road, you idiot. You're ruining the parade. And then all it takes is one kid, just one kid, to whip a hard candy at his head. And the next thing you know, Alexander Hamilton is dodging a hailstorm of parade candy. Tootsie Rolls, Dum Dums, Lemonheads are pummeling this poor fool as he starts frantically searching the road for his missing shoes. Now, the high school marching band is fast approaching. 
you can hear their kind of wonky version of Stars and Stripes Forever getting louder and louder, and it's just barely loud enough to cover the fact that the crowd is roaring at Hamilton, who is now on his hands and knees and trying to wrestle his shoe away from the jaws of the hobby shop dog. (laughs) And that dog is not budging. It's got his teeth in that shoe, and Hamilton is just a pathetic mess. And I never did find out if he got his shoe back. Because by that time, the marching band is passing, and when they were finally gone, so was Hamilton. So while I may not have been thrilled to start summer school the next week, I gotta say, that image of my algebra teacher in snagged stockings and a candy-coated Hamilton jacket, well, that certainly made those long days just the slightest bit more tolerable. And good news, I passed his class. Not that he said a single goddamn word to me for those four weeks, which I think suited us just fine. That didn't stop me from leaving him a small parting gift on the last day. A single colonial shoe filled to the brim with lemon heads. <laughs> Cheers, y'all. So I have a question that I want to pose to you. What is the craziest thing that you have ever done for money? If you will recall in an earlier episode, I might have mentioned that for a brief while, I was a stripper for private parties with my girlfriend, Crazy Town. And you would think that might be the craziest thing I've ever done for money. And you would be wrong. No, that unfortunate distinction goes to the time that I agreed to coordinate a full-on fireworks display for a local band. To say that I needed the cash would be a dramatic understatement. At the time, I was unemployed and so utterly broke, I was living with my sister, my younger sister, in a house that she owned. Believe me, this is a new kind of humiliation. I was in my upper 20s and hadn't been back in Chicago for more than a year or two before being laid off again from another corporate writing gig. I mean, I was really trying hard to get my shit together because I was still paying off debt that I had accrued in Los Angeles. So this particular layoff really stung. My only options were to move in with my parents, move in with a guy I was seeing, or shack up at my sister's house, which really was the lesser of all three evils. And it really was, so please don't think I was ungrateful for the option. I mean, my family has saved me from sleeping in cardboard boxes more times than I can count but it certainly didn't help my self-esteem. As for that guy I was dating, I'll call him the snoozer. And there was no way I could see myself living with him. It's not that he was a bad guy, really. I mean, the snoozer was a decent guy who just happened to have the dramatically annoying habit of being a really, really deep sleeper. And if that doesn't sound like it would be that big of a deal, just wait. His entire bedroom was rigged to make noise on schedule so that this guy wouldn't oversleep. It started with four alarms that were scheduled to go off five minutes apart, each louder than the next. If he managed to sleep through those, and believe me, he did, he had a fifth alarm clock that had, no lie, a 113 decibel siren and bed shaker. It was like waking up inside the engine of a 747. And even after all of that mayhem, the guy would yawn and putter and just be uselessly groggy for at least an hour. I have no doubt I could reanimate a corpse quicker than it took to get him moving in the morning. But here's where rationalization makes its grand entrance. Because aside from that laborious oddity, I didn't dislike him. I just took to ducking out in the middle of the night like some kind of pathetic call girl. Besides, he played in one of Chicago's better bands, and I always enjoyed hanging out with them. We were all gathered in the rehearsal space one night when the snoozer came up with the idea of throwing a huge 4th of July bash for all of their fans. Now, were this any other band, they would have spent hours fantasizing about the greatest gig ever, you know, complete with fire-breathing lions flanking the stage and maybe Kiss as openers, and then looked at me to make it all happen. But this band was different. They knew how to get shit done. And in just three days, they were handing out flyers advertising the event. It seemed they all knew a guy who owed them a favor. 
The singer's uncle had convinced the town council to let them hold the party in the parking lot of an abandoned Home Depot store. Another family member got them a deal on porta potties. And apparently, one of them knew a guy who knew a guy who got them a crapload of professional fireworks. They were all piled up in the rehearsal studio one night, boxes full of shells, mortars, and cakes, and weirdly, all of them in plain paper casings. No colorful pictures of explosions, no angry warnings, just a few strings of meaningless numbers on the bottom of the casings. So I look at all this and I go, what the hell is this? And then the band on cue looks at me expectantly, thinking that I could tell them that. I start to rifle through that heaping fire hazard. Back in the day, my dad, the physicist, used to put on professional firework displays. And he'd let me give him a hand with some of the setup. But he held all of the proper class explosive licenses. And although the warnings on his fireworks were written in Chinese, at least you could tell from the pictures what everything did. So I look at the guys and I ask, did all of this shit fall off the back of a truck? I don't get an answer. Instead, the snoozer has a request. They want me to be in charge of the firework display for the party. Oh, no. No way, guys. Come on. I mean, I really didn't know when any of that stuff did, and I sure as hell didn't want to be responsible for figuring it out. But then the singer pulls out his wallet. All right. I'm listening. (laughs) He hands me two crisp $100 bills, and God, were they beautiful. I could hear my dad in the way, way back of my brain lecturing me on firework safety and good decisions, but those hundreds spoke louder. Still, I wasn't entirely sold. I mean, how do I know any of this stuff is safe? The singer swears it's all legit, and he says, look, our guy got this stuff in bulk. That's why it doesn't have any wrappers. Oh, I have questions. Still so many questions. Not the least of which is how in the world is any of this legal? And the general response I get to all my questions is, don't worry about it. I start to feel less like I'm dealing with a band now and more like it's a team of good fellas. Of course, good fellas don't beg or whine or plead, and that is exactly what this band started to do. And they're saying, please. You're the only one who knows anything about this stuff. Please help us. And they were right about that. I did have some experience. And honestly, the thought of some half-witted, half-drunk band guy getting his hands on that much gunpowder, well, that scared me more than any of the thought of potential damage I could do. So I pocketed that 200 bucks along with my sanity, and I agreed to help. The first thing I did was tackle that mountain of pyrotechnics and start sorting. Even if I wasn't sure what each firework would look like, I at least had an idea of what it would do. I mean, the mortars would fire some sort of single shot, and the cakes would either send up a bunch of aerial shells or maybe little Roman candle things. So my plan was to mount everything across several slabs of plywood and fuse it all together. I figured the less time I spent igniting things, the better. Then I'll tell you, if there is anything I learned from my dad helping him with his displays, it's how to properly fuse fireworks. It is an odd skill to have, I know. But I spent hours upon hours with my dad every summer cutting safety fuse and listening as he explained. He'd say, daughter? That's what he would call me when he wanted me to pay attention. Daughter? The mistake most people make is trying to connect fuses end-to-end. What you want to do is connect them side-by-side. That way, the fuse that's giving you fire will always be burning against the fuse you want to take the fire. I don't know why I always remembered that, but it came in handy. (laughs) So over the next few days, I turned that rehearsal room into my own pyro den. I had to be breaking at least 10 laws in there. But once I got everything arranged, mounted, and fused, I had to admit I was pretty pleased. I mean, I was the chick who couldn't even cut wrapping paper straight. 
and I was too uncoordinated to figure out how to knit. But here, I had managed to create the world's most dangerous circuit board, and it looked really cool. I'm not sure if my dad would be pleased or horrified with how I utilized his wisdom. Oh, but the day of the party, though, my confidence plummeted. I started to regret not calling my dad for help. I'm sure he would have been thrilled to give a hand, but, you know, damn it, I was just sick and tired of having my family bail me out all the time. Sure, they might be bailing me out of jail if this didn't go well, but at least I would have gotten there on my own. And damn those musicians. While they had put the display planks at the far end of the parking lot as I'd instructed, those dummies had actually parked their RV right next to them. Because nothing combines with 400 pounds of gunpowder quite like gasoline. Still, despite that little nugget of stupidity, I had to hand it to the band. They'd actually done a really good job organizing the party. Sound check had gone well, the kegs had arrived on time, and by three o'clock there were at least a hundred people hanging out in the lot. As for me, since I definitely did not want to drink, I was spending most of my time in the RV with the snoozer. He was sprawled out on the couch in the back, napping, and I had explicit instructions to wake him before seven so that he could get ready for the gig. My plan was to douse him with a bottle of water if he wouldn't wake up. I will say it was a little bit boring just sitting there in the RV staring at my sleeping boyfriend. So, when the opening band started, I decided to go watch. I mean, the fireworks seemed secure enough, and there weren't any people around to mess with them, so I figure, they'll be fine. Why wouldn't they? And that's exactly where I fucked up. Because, y'all, something my dad had never mentioned in all of his lessons in explosives is to never trust musicians. And if you learn anything from my podcast, all 142 episodes, it is to never trust musicians. (laughs) I was off in the crowd watching the opening band when I heard the first kind of crackle. And it didn't even occur to me that it was the fireworks. I just thought there was a short in one of the speaker cables. So I'm about to wander over to the sound booth when I hear it again, louder, and this time accompanied by yelling. Oh, oh, that feeling. I mean, you just feel that sinking feeling right down to your butt. I didn't want to turn around. I really didn't. But then I hear my name shouted across the parking lot, and I am forced to turn around and confront my worst nightmare. Somehow, someone managed to ignite the display. The first of the cakes is launching a series of shells into the sky where they just fizz and explode against the sunny background. I run over to the planks and see that the fuses are just sparking away perfectly. And they're just about to launch off a series of single-shot tubes. And for a minute, I forget my panic, and I'm just excited because I kind of want to see what those shells are going to launch. The first one goes off, and it's an aerial bomb essentially a shell that explodes in the air with a massive boom. It is insanely jarring. And it jolts me back into reality as I wonder, what the fuck am I gonna do? Can I save this display and not get blown up in the process? As I stare dumbly at this electric ground, I hear more yelling coming from the side of the RV. I see that the lead singer of the band has grabbed his drummer by the shirt collar and he is knocking his head against the RV wall. And he's yelling, what the fuck did you do, man? And the drummer doesn't even have a chance to answer before the singer clocks his head against the wall again, and he's yelling, I should kill you, you stupid ass. All I needed to see was a crushed pack of cigarettes on the ground to realize what had happened. Leave it to the goddamn drummer to fuck everything up. All it took one careless cigarette butt to set off 400 pounds worth of explosives. The singer tosses the drummer aside when he sees me, and he runs up and he says, you've got to stop this. Can't you cut a fuse or something? Dude, this isn't Mission Impossible. I'm not going to stick my face over a flaming plank of explosives. (laughs) So then the singer's like, well, let me get the fire extinguisher. 
And for a minute, I thought that might be a good idea. But then I said, no, no, it'll ruin everything. And then I just look at him and I say, we just got to let it roll. And y'all, it was spectacular. By now, the band and the crowd have taken notice of the fireworks and they're squinting up at the sky. The colorful displays look a little glittery, but not quite as bright as they could against the blue and white background. But it was still cool. And the band is playing a broken but optimistic version of the Star Spangled Banner. People are singing along and cheering. And I have to admit, I was feeling pretty damn proud of myself. My hack firework job may have been inadvertently deployed early, but damn it, it worked. Half an hour later, I'm finally able to enjoy the party. I've got a solo cup full of Jack and Coke, and I'm hanging out with friends when I see my boyfriend. Remember him, the snoozer? He stumbles out of the RV, and he's confused and walking over to us looking really groggy and kind of out of sorts. He sees me drinking and sees the drummer with an ice pack on his head. (laughs) And he says, hey, guys, did you hear something? I thought I heard thunder or something like that. We all stare at him for a moment, just jaws dropped until I break the silence and I say, nope, I didn't hear a goddamn thing. (laughs) Cheers, y'all. Well, I hope you all don't mind if I'm sharing these 4th of July crazy stories a little early. See, my guy and I are going to be taking a week off from the podcast to visit our friends up in Michigan for the 4th of July week. I promise you I will be coming home with more crazy bourbon-soaked stories. In the meantime, head on over to theunwritablerant.com to catch up on back episodes or find my YouTube channel or connect with me on social media. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. Hope you have a great week and a very happy 4th of July. Cheers, y'all. Go to theunwritablerant.com and sign up to get early access to interviews and new videos. And don't forget to connect with Juliet on Twitter at Morning Neurosis. Yeah, he was pretty as a Sunday morning, standing on the corner at Carondelet. What you say we make our way up to Bourbon? A couple hurricanes and a hand grenade and get blown away. Chips fall where they may If it's all the same What you say, bon ton lay Yeah, pretty mama, I can smell the gumbo Sweetest taste of honeysuckle on my lips Good God Almighty, I can hear the trombone Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this Come a little closer, honey, let me hold you Nothing tastes better than a bourbon kiss You can be the flower on my magnolia Every heart ought to be to a